Most of us don't think of breathing as work, but as of Tuesday night, you should realize that at least part of our ventilation rhythm does require the use of ATP for muscle contraction. Therefore, inhalation is considered to be work. But none of you are sitting there thinking, wow, just taking a breath in, I'm working so hard, I need a nap. Right? We don't need a nap just from breathing. But tonight I'm going to tell you about diseased states. And I'm going to tell you the difference between obstructive versus restrictive disorders. Obstructive disorders are a problem with exhale or and or exchange. There will be three that I highlight in that category. The three that I will highlight, and you will see this in future slides, are emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and asthma. All three have their unique characteristics, their unique traits in the disease state, but all of them are under the obstructive category, which means exhale slash exchange is the problem. They work harder at that. Under the restrictive category, that is a problem with inhalation. <coughs> inhalation is already ATP consuming. People with restrictive disorders really consume a lot of ATP to get that same 500 milliliters in their lungs that you and I do. Lots of things can go into the restrictive category. It could be scoliosis, it could be kyphosis, any curvature of the spine that is not normal or exaggerated can be a restrictive disorder. We will also, we've, we talked about on Tuesday pneumothoraxes, remember the, the video I showed you? Well, clearly one lung in Mark Wahlberg was difficult to inflate, that's a restrictive disorder. But one that I will highlight quite a bit will be surfactant lack. And tonight I will tell you what surfactant is, and I will also teach you another gas law, well it's a pseudo gas law, called Laplace's law. It's actually a law that has everything to do with bubbles. Yeah, remember when you used to blow bubbles as a kid? No? Yes? The plastic bottle filled with the magic soap juice with the magic wand inside, and you'd put the bottle down on the ground, and you'd be blowing, and you'd go chase, and you'd knock over the bottle. <laughs> that always happened. And then you thought you could just go to the faucet and fill it back up with water, because it looked like water, and that didn't work well, did it? So I'm gonna tell you what surfactant is. It is a soap-like molecule. And we're gonna talk about bubbles and how do bubbles actually go along with breathing and work of breathing. Well, I, I think you'll be surprised when I get to that section how well related they are. <coughs> so when we're talking about the lungs, we know that they have, elast they have elastic properties. And elastic property means stretchability. Now if you read compliance, lung compliance, I want you to think of the lungs stretching. Like we talked about on Tuesday, their distensibility, pushing them open. They are not muscular structures. They must be compliant. When the chest wall expands, they get stretched open. If you read recoil, it means elasticity. And I'm referring to the most important part of elasticity, which is the recoil. So in your homework packet, there are some questions that ask you about the elasticity of the lung. Insert recoil. I'm asking about the recoil. And when we speak of homeostasis, we need the lungs to be balanced. If they are overly compliant, that means they're easily stretched, but they don't recoil well. That's gonna be a difficulty now for the person to exhale. If they are overly recoiled, then that means they're difficult to inflate. That's going to be a restrictive disorder. Compliance equals a change in volume for any given change in pressure. If I come down here, let's just pick this part on the x-axis. I'm gonna go up here so maybe you'll catch just this. If 
I pick right here on my x-axis, which lung, A or B, is more compliant? Which one changes volume the most for this pressure? A, right? Gives me the most volume change. Now in the next slide, I'm going to rearrange this equation. Compliance equals change in volume for any given change in pressure. We know that the lungs are not muscular structures. They cannot change volume on their own. We learned on Tuesday that we change volume first, then it leads to pressure differences, then we get flow. So I am going to rearrange this equation to solve for volume because that's our starting point when we're wanting to breathe in. We must make a volume change first. That means volume change equals compliance times change in pressure. And on the next slide, I'm going to tell you what factors influence compliance and what factors influence this change in pressure. And notice that it, I, on my x-axis, it was distending pressure. And if you go back to Tuesday night, I told you about four different <laughs> kinds of pressures. Alveolar pressure, atmospheric pressure, intrapleural pressure, and transpulmonary pressure. Transpulmonary pressure was the difference between alveolar pressure and intrapleural pressure. It is always positive. And I told you on Tuesday that transpulmonary pressure was the distending pressure, the pressure to push the lungs open. So how can we make intrapleural pressure more negative, which in turn will make the transpulmonary pressure even more positive? I'll remind you from Tuesday, we said that the chest wall and the lungs want to recoil in different directions. They're constantly pulling against each other, and that helps with the negative pressure inside the intrapleural cavity. So their natural recoil in the different directions helps make that intrapleural pressure negative. But we can augment the chest wall going into its recoil mode by strengthening the contraction of the wall of the muscles that are like the external intercostals in the diaphragm. If we make them contract even better, the chest wall gets to move in the direction it wants to move in even better. That would definitely make this even more negative. So that's our distending pressure. What about compliance? Compliance means stretchability. Compliance, easy to, just, to stretch, right? Stretch, because remember I said elasticity was recoil. So compliance, stretching. We need good pressure to make them stretch, but they need elastic tissue. Collagen fibers don't stretch. So we need good elastic tissue. We don't want scar tissue in the lungs. Now, scientists, when they were studying the lung anatomy and physiology, <clears throat> and I'll tell you more about this story, they found that the elastic tissue, the actual elastin threads, only accounted for one-third of the lung's compliance, stretchability, being able to open up. Two-thirds of the lung's compliance actually came from a substance called surfactant. So in other words, the elastic tissue is not enough. And it's not even the majority of the reason why the lungs can stretch open. It's surfactant. The surfactant is a, whew, it's contagious. <laughs> right here, a third. <laughs> Surfactant is a soap-like molecule. I'll tell you more about it in just a moment. And surfactant, until I get there, remember um, when we talked about cohesiveness of the water around the lungs, the suction cup? The water cohesiveness around the lungs is a good thing. That's what makes the surface of the lungs somewhat tethered anatomically to the chest wall. But inside your lungs, you have mucous membranes. And alveoli are these cup-like structures. And there's a, a little bit of water in there. Not a lot, but th these are mucous membranes. So if the alveoli collapse, 
Did, did we talk about wearing contact lenses on Tuesday? Okay, well, I'll do that now. How many of you wear contact lenses or do have them? Okay, that's not enough. Everyone's like, <laughs> how many know what a contact lens is? And there we go. So a contact lens is this half sphere piece of plastic that we put on the surface of our eye. It comes out of a container, it is wet, the surface of our eye is wet, go ahead and touch it if you want. And when we put that contact lens that's wet on the surface of our eye that is also wet, the cohesive properties of water make that contact lens stay on your cornea. Right? Barring you going, let me move it around. At the end of the day, or whenever you take your contact lenses out, for those of you who don't wear them, it is a very stressful time. <laughs> it's extremely stressful because we must now apply enough pressure to pull the contact lens off of our cornea, fighting against the cohesive properties of water. And it's strong. So we have to pull hard enough to pull it off our eye without ripping off our cornea at the same time. And it's really stressful, especially when you first start wearing them and you're, you're starting to get that technique of how hard do I have to pull? And sometimes you're like, oh, it'll just pop now. And then you're like, oh. <laughs> So when you first get them, you don't have that finesse down. And for me, it was like, oh, I gotta take them out. And I'd go to the bathroom, and I'd be like, <sighs> I'd go to the sink. And I pull, but I'd be so good at like pulling hard, but then getting it off my eye that my contact lens would turn into a taco. And then before I realized what was happening, I'd be like, piece of plastic, cohesive property, water in between. So I'm like, and you're pulling and you're pulling and then you rip it. And it takes a while before you go, oh, if I just get my saline solution, fight water with water. Remember my, me acting out the cohesive? No! Do yes. it! <laughs> so if you just squirt water, then all the water molecules inside your little taco contact lens are like, oh, there's more. <laughs> and it just opens up. It's super happy. Your alveoli are like that. Can you imagine when you exhale all of your millions of alveoli going, fink, taco, and then you have to open them up. That's part of the compliance part. You have to peel them open. That's not elastic tissue. The alveoli, simple squamous epithelium. There is no elastin. What you need is surfactant, and it's a detergent that lines the internal surface of the alveolus and disrupts the water molecules from linking together through their somewhat polar bonds, their hydrogen bonds, right? So surfactant breaks them up. They can't go, kumbaya, Lincoln, just keep swimming down. Can't do that. Without surfactant, your elastic tissue is not enough for you to get your lungs to be compliant. It's not enough. I'm going to go through our diseased states and two main concepts that I want you to keep in mind when we're talking about breathing and the work of breathing. We've got two things that make our breathing difficult. We need to overcome the resistance of the air passageways. We get to come back to Poissouillet's law. We know that Poissouillet's law said that the blood viscosity, blood vessel length, and the radius of the blood vessel were very important, but which three was the most important for resistance? Which of the three? Radius, to what power? So guess what? 
We have air passageways, and I showed you this on Tuesday, that don't have cartilage to keep them open. And they're surrounded by smooth muscle, like these small bronchioles. And the smooth muscle can contract, which would lead to bronchial constriction. We start to learn about this in Unit 2. So when we talk about overcoming resistance, we're right back to Poissuyer's law, the radius of our bronchioles. If the radius goes down, resistance goes up. Remember, radius and resistance are inversely related, but not linearly to the power of 4. There's another issue, the elasticity of the lung. We have to overcome it. It wants to recoil. We need it to open. We need good distending pressure. We need the elastic fibers, and we need surfactant. Those are all the three things we need to get them to open. So we're going to go through these as I discuss the disease states. On Tuesday, I told you about how I had to teach my boys that air flows from high pressure to low, and they were like, what do you mean by that? And I said, come here, stick your head by the fan. So when I found this animation, I was like, that is what the boys look like. <laughs> when you start looking at a patient trying to assess what kind of breathing issue they have, chances are very likely, if you watch them long enough, you can predict what part of a breathing disorder they have. Is it restrictive for inhalation or obstructive for exhalation slash exchange? You need to pay attention to the rate and depth of their breathing. Both are changed. If it's a restrictive disorder, they will take short, shallow, rapid breaths, like the anaconda is around them. If it's an obstructive disorder, they will take long, deep breaths, and they will focus more on a long exhale. Both of these people will posture themselves in a certain way, and I'll talk about that. And in some of the disease states that I'll talk about, sometimes the patient, nothing they do can help. They can't, they can't posture themselves in a way that helps with the gas exchange. And I'll be telling you about blue bloaters and pink puffers in just a moment. Now you should not call your patients that. You should not say, go check out the pink puffer in room two, or check out the blue bloater in room 12. Should not refer to them as that, but you know, secretly we do, we do. And I'll explain what those terms mean in just a moment. So let's cover Poissuyer's law in overcoming the resistance of our air passageways. Knowing that we can have bronchial dilation and bronchial constriction. We've already reviewed that radius <coughs> is the most important factor in Poissuyer's law to the power of four. Now, which air passageways have the greatest tendency for resistance? To have not only a tendency for collapse, constriction, but also we have too many air passageways converging onto fewer, bigger ones. Let me explain. That was a lot. Let me explain. Have you ever been on a two-lane highway? You could pass the semi-trailer truck in front of you, but it's dangerous, especially on the 395. And the traffic is building up behind this trailer truck. And then all of a sudden you see the sign, passing lane, two miles. And you know in two miles, if you just be patient, wait your time, you're going to have two lanes. And you can get around that trailer truck, correct? So until then, one lane in your direction, very narrow lane, a lot of resistance, a lot of traffic building up. And don't you love it when the asshole 10 cars back gets frustrated and tries to pass all of you and narrowly makes it, but only makes it because everybody else slams on their brakes to let them back in because they're an idiot. Are you that idiot? Because if you are, I'm not letting you in. <laughs> Hope you don't have a loved one with you. <laughs> and I won't stop for you either. <laughs> Help. 
Anyway, one lane going to many lanes, even to more lanes, to more. If we diverge, less resistance, right? So if you think about your air coming in your lungs, coming in your one trachea to two bron bronchi, to more secondary bronchi, to tertiary bronchi, we're going from few to many to many to many. In other words, the 500 milliliters that you're inhaling has many options. And as it goes in, there's less resistance, more options, more lanes. But as you exhale, the air is coming out of your millions of alveoli to fewer respiratory bronchioles, to fewer terminal bronchioles, to fewer small size bronchioles, to mid size. You get the idea, till we're converging onto one trachea. And it might surprise you that it's these mid sized bronchioles where we get this most convergence, many leading to significantly fewer. So there's going to be traffic resistance, and those mid-sized bronchioles are prone to collapse, and I'll show you a picture of that in just a moment. So that's where we're going to find most of our resistance. And in a couple of weeks, you're going to do a lab. You're going to do spirometry values. You're going to, you're going to breathe into these tubes, and we're going to measure how well you breathe. One of the tests you're going to do, you're going to try and blow out as much as you can, as hard as you can, as fast as you can. And I will be your coach. And it will go something like this. Blow, 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 harder, 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 blow, blow, blow. And this is what you're going to look like. And that's what you're going to do because you start like it hurts. It really hurts. And then you're going to, you're going to, they, they don't believe me until they try it. Right, Cole? Well, I remember when Chris did, what was it, Old Betsy? Yes, the white one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, that was an interesting time. Yes. It's not comfortable. That's why it is an optional lab. You can either do your own or in your lab manuals, we already have pre-recorded tracings for you. So you could say, no, thank you. I'm just going to, I'm going to pretend this picture is me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you decide to do it, or someone in the class decides to do it, pay attention to them. Watch them. The harder they blow, and I'll be, go, 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 and they're going to be, <gasps> And they're going to be really visibly working hard, but you're going to see the pen just going, so frustrating. No change. They feel like they're working hard. They feel like something's coming out, but the pen's like, nope. And when that happens, the reason why that happens, I should say, is that those mid-sized air bronchioles don't have cartilaginous plates. This is where we have the most convergence. The harder you push, the more you compress them shut. The harder you try to exhale, the more it is for not. All that air gets trapped behind the compression point. So you may work really, really hard, but the fact is 80% of your air comes out in the first second you exhale. The harder you work to get more out, not happening, not happening. So that is what I mean by working at exhale. How many of you have asthma? Yeah, that's frustrating, isn't it? Now, when you have an asthma attack, because I have asthma too, I know what it feels like. We have a problem when we have asthma, getting air in and out of our lungs. We are struggling with both. But when we are actively having an attack, there is one part of our breathing cycle that we work at the most, and that's exhale. And I can prove it to you. Have any of you seen someone having an asthma attack? It might shock you that they don't look how you would predict them to look or sound when they're having an asthma attack. For example, when I was younger, sometimes I wouldn't try and get out of going to school Sometimes I'd get out of, try, of walking to school, and I, I lived a block away from school, a block. The school was in my tract. So I would try and get a ride. I didn't want to walk. 
my, I knew not to even ask my dad because my dad lived on a farm in rural Iowa. And anytime I tell him, oh, I had to walk, he said, really? I had to walk five miles uphill both ways wearing my sister's shoes. <laughs> and I'm not going to ask my dad. So I'd ask my mom, the nurse. You think she'd have some empathy? Nope. Nope. So I would have to fake being sick just to see if she'd give me a ride. So here's what I did one day. <sighs> Mom, I need a ride to school. <sighs> I'm having an asthma attack. <sighs> Will you give me a ride to school, Mom? <sighs> and my mom's like, and here's your lunch, and here's your book bag, and there's the door. Don't let it hit you on the way out. Being a nurse, she knew breathing in wasn't the work of breathing for an asthma attack. It's the exhale. <sighs> they don't sound like that. You don't hear this wheezing necessarily. What they present with is usually this. <coughs> And a cough is a forced exhale. If you have your stethoscope and you listen to their air sounds in their lungs, you will hear trapped air, trapped distant sounds is what we say. And in between them gasping, you can actually hear some of this air just kind of squeaking out of those <coughs> air passageways. So that's usually what it sounds like and what it looks like. They're having an, a, a coughing spasm, and you might, dis, you might dismiss it. So Mac one time had a little friend over when they were just little guys. He had a friend over spending the night. And I try and make things really fun when kids come over to spend the night. If it's a nice night and it's summertime, we go night swimming. I turn off all the pool lights and I'm I'm the serpent <laughs> and they have to get from you know free base to base without the serpent getting them but it's all dark and creepy and super fun or the park behind us this the giant sprinklers come on so we go running in the sprinklers in the middle of the night awesome stand in front of these big blasters running with all the duck shit and goose shit it's just <laughs> awesome and you know slip and sliding because they leave the sprinklers on too long and sliding in all the goose shit and duck shit <laughs> super fun <clears throat> so we were out having this you know amazing night and then the boys came in and they wanted they got showered and i bleached them and then <laughs> they wanted to play video games and I kept hearing coughing, 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 coughing. And Honey went and checked on Dempsey, and he comes out and went, Dempsey needs some cough medicine. I said, that's not what he needs. He needs his inhaler. Did his mom send it with him? That's an asthma attack. Sure enough, Dempsey's in there just having this full-blown asthma attack, totally oblivious to it because Dempsey was too enthralled with playing <laughs> video games and he doesn't get to play them very often or didn't at the time. So he's that kid that's like, <laughs> if the character had a jump, he's doing it. And I'm like, it's not a wee. It's not a wee. <laughs> so he's just, <coughs> <coughs> Dempsey, honey, where's your inhaler? He goes to his bag. All I have is my steroid. Like, where's your rescue inhaler? Didn't have it. I'm like, I need it. So I call his mom. No one's answering. No one's answering. No one's answering. Now Hayden and I both have rescue inhalers, albuterol. Yeah, but the prescription name does not have Dempsey's name on it. And I'm like, <laughs> kid needs it. It's not his. Parents not answering. So I left a message for the mom, like, if you do not reply in two minutes, I am giving your child a puff of my albuterol. <laughs> your kid needs it. Sure enough, within two minutes, she's on the phone. I'm on my way. She's a nurse. So she shows up with her stethoscope, <laughs> the albuterol rescue inhaler. I go ahead. She's like listening to him. 
Yes, he's having an asthma attack. Well, I know, I don't need a stethoscope. Well, I know he's having an asthma attack. Anyway, he was just fine once he got that rescue inhaler because we know albuterol stimulates beta-2 receptors, which causes the smooth muscle to relax, increasing the radius of the air passageways, and now Dempsey can exhale better. The two other disease states fall in the obstructive category as well, and they are still a problem with exhale and or gas exchange. With all of these, you're gonna have a lot of trapped, dirty air. And the amount of air left over in your lungs at the end of a normal exhale is called functional residual capacity. And I know that I need to go over our respiratory volumes and capacities, and I will in just a moment. I know that's the last three slides or so from Tuesday. But the last few slides of this lecture also go with lab. So I'm going to do all of those together. So after our break, we'll go over our breathing volumes and capacities. Right now, functional residual capacity is, everyone just breathe out normally, stop. The amount of air still left in your lungs is called your FRC. It represents your dirty air. Now, breathe out. Breathe out more. That extra air you breathed out is called your expiratory reserve volume. That's the extra air you can breathe out after a normal exhale. <clears throat> FRC is the amount of air in your lungs after a normal exhale. So it includes your expiratory reserve volume, the extra air you could push out, and it also includes air in your lungs that you can never push out called your residual volume. If you deflate a balloon, <clears throat> Is the air 100% completely out of it? Isn't there still some air in it? That's residual volume. When you exhale as much as you can, there's still some air left over. And when a person dies, some of that air can kind of leak out, which is kind of creepy. And I'm going to warn you, one of the jokes, practical jokes, People like to play in a hospital setting for new people <clears throat> that are coming in to volunteer, say. If a patient dies, you might have someone say, hey, do you want to help me take the body to the morgue or wherever they're going to transport it? If you want to go, you want to go get the body, we're going to put it on a gurney. We're going to... You might say, sure, I'll help you. And be careful because as you start to move that body, because they've died and all the muscle is now lax and relaxed, as you move that body, you might have some of that air kind of squeeze out of the lungs. And when it squeezes out over their vocal cords, you might, huh. <laughs> which will make you go, ha! Ah! <laughs> and then the body hits the floor, which is not okay. It's alive! He's alive still! No, no. It's just you've been punked. <laughs> they want to freak you out. The person is definitely dead. It's just that residual volume can kind of leak out as you move the body around. So now you've been warned. Don't let them punk you. Now, how can we have obstruction? I told this story to the Monday, Wednesday class, and when I started telling them, they're like, no, -uh, no, -uh. I'm like, yes, it's true. I'm not, not lying to you. We can actually have something obstructing the air passageway. This could be excessive mucus. If I have a lot of mucus pooling in here, then the radius would be smaller, right, for the actual air to move through. You can actually aspirate something into your lungs. If you aspirate something into your lungs, it'll likely lodge into the right lung because that is a straight shot versus the left lung has to go around the heart. And <clears throat> I was telling them, yeah, people can aspirate things. It happens. It doesn't just get stuck in their larynx. It can go all the way down to your lungs. Ah, oh, no, I never. I said, yeah, it can. It can happen. And I gave an example that my brother, when we were younger, 
it was all the rage to collect stickers and have a sticker book when you were young and what do you remember this and you'd have your scratch and sniff sticker book and you'd have your unicorn sticker book and your glitter sticker sticker book <clears throat> and you would have your garbage pail sticker book and then you'd have those tiny little puffer sticker puffy stickers and some people are like yeah it's nail polish on my nails so my brother <clears throat> didn't have a sticker book because my dad thought, well, that's for girls. So he would try and steal our stickers, and then we would say, you, you took our stickers, and he'd say, no, I didn't. And we would go to all of his usual hiding spaces to try and find them. Well, the little puffy stickers, he found a very unique place to hide them. And he would shove them up his nose <laughs> all the way back, all the way back, and he, it was an art form for him, he'd go and then when he wanted to spin it back out, <laughs> he would hide other things in his nose too, I don't know why, mothballs, mothballs. Anyway, there were times where he tried to do that trick and it would get lodged in his larynx so my mom would have to do the Heimlich maneuver on him. But it could, I mean, these could have easily gone down into his lung. And then I said, and it can and does happen. There was this man, and I read about him in an article in a, in a clinical medical journal. And they thought this guy had cancer. They saw a mass growing in his lung. And it wasn't responding to chemotherapy, et cetera, et cetera. So they were like, we need to go in and do surgery. When they went in to do surgery, they were surprised to find that it was a peanut plant that had germinated and was growing in the man's lung. So he had aspirated a raw peanut seed that germinated and was starting to grow. I know. So clearly that would be an obstruction. <laughs> We can also have hypertrophy of the smooth muscle growing into the lumen. That is not a new concept. In Unit 3, we learned about hypertrophy of the cardiac muscle and how it can grow into the chambers. We can also have destruction of the alveoli. Alveoli are not independent structures. They share common walls. And these shared common walls are very important, very important. And if alveoli are destroyed, if you break down alveoli, you get fewer of them, but bigger. Do you think that's better? But why? Less surface area. So I'll explain for everyone else. My neighbor is an artist. And when she displays her art, she hangs her art on walls, in one room and in the next. She always gets frustrated when she has a whole bunch of people over to see her art because then they have to kind of get through the door jams and, and get from one room to the next. And when I'm helping her clean up, she says, Kara, I'm gonna knock down this wall. It's not load bearing, I'm gonna knock it down. I'll have a big room. People can then have an easier time moving around to see my paintings. And I said, that's great, Dandy. However, if you knock down that wall, yes, you will have a bigger room, but where are you gonna hang your art? You've lost two sides to hang up your art. She's like, oh, I didn't think of that. And that's what I want you to remember. If I break down alveoli and make fewer but bigger of them, bigger, alveoli, I lose surface area for gas exchange. And that's an obstructive issue. Remember, exhale or exchange. <clears throat> Mathematically, just to prove you that Poissouillet's law reigns for this issue when we're talking about overcoming resistance, if we only have to create one to two millimeters of mercury of pressure difference between out here and in here, to get air in or out of our lungs. Imagine if the radius of your air passageways was cut in half, if you went from two to one millimeters. According to Poissouillet's law, that would be if I cut my radius in half, one half times one half times one half times one half, which would be one over 16. 
Radius and resistance are inversely related, so that means resistance would go up 16-fold. If resistance goes up 16-fold, then I am going to have to create a pressure gradient 16 times higher than normal. And if my normal pressure gradient is one to two millimeters of mercury of difference between out here and in here, now I'm looking at creating 16 to 32 millimeters of mercury of a pressure gradient difference to get the same 500 milliliters of air in and out of my lungs. And that's a lot of work. That is going to be a significant amount of work in your patient. And you will see it. <clears throat> there is something else when it comes to resistance and overcoming it. We forget that elastic tissues have to anchor into something on both ends. If there was a rubber band in front of you, laying on the desk in front of you, rubber bands stretch. Okay, so it won't stretch. <coughs> okay, then... Here's my lanyard. Stretch. I'm holding it on one end. I'm holding it. Why won't it go? Still not. Have you ever tried to use a measuring tape and no one's around to help you? <laughs> You're like. And you're trying to get the little lip to stick on something. We need support on two ends. Elastic fibers are the same. They're a lot like muscle. They need an origin and insertion if you want to think of it that way. So these elastic fibers, many of them insert on the air passageways, on the outside of them. And then they might insert on the other end to another air passageway. Or over here, it might insert to the underside of the lung. But they have to be anchored. And as the chest wall expands, the lung must go with it, and all of these elastic threads get pulled. And as they get pulled, if they all anchor on a common air passageway, they can pull open the air passageway. So the elastic fibers can help open air passageways. But if they get all lax, if they lose their tractive forces, if they, they, they're, if they just are then they're not going to pull taut. They're not going to open those air passageways. And that's going to lead to even more resistance. Graphically, you saw this on Tuesday. And this is me now trying to show you, if you have more resistance, you're going to have to create more of a pressure gradient to get the same air, 500 milliliters in, 500 milliliters out, more pressure gradient. You're going to be working harder to ventilate. You're going to be using a lot of ATP. As I've already reviewed, we can take albuterol, which stimulates the beta-2 receptors and leads to bronchial dilation. But just to remind you from unit two, another op option we can have or take is to block muscarinic acetylcholine receptors. If we do that, we block the parasympathetic division, and that means indirectly we give more control to the sympathetic division. What drug can we give that can be an aerosol form to hit those muscarinic acetylcholine receptors in the lung? And that's called ipotropium, and I have that written down on the slide in just a moment. So, again, we're focusing on disease states, overcoming the work of breathing, or recognizing how some people have to work at breathing even more. Let's go through obstructive disorders, the big common three, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and asthma. I will start with asthma first. They all have their unique characteristics as shown in the top picture with a lot of overlap similarities between them. They are all considered chronic obstructive pulmonary disorders, COPD, where exhale or exchange or both is a problem. With asthma, we have an allergen, uh, antigen, 
provokes the immune response, it binds to an antibody called IgE. The allergen and IgE form a complex which binds to receptors on mast cells. The mast cells release copious amounts of heparin, histamine, and other granules. Let's focus on histamine. We know that histamine is frequently used as a local signal, cells to signal surrounding cells. In an inflammatory process, this is considered to be a distress signal. When there's a lot of histamine around, the smooth muscle around bronchioles will constrict, as shown in the picture to the right. <clears throat> and histamine causes a lot of edema. We know that it leads to more arterial dilation, more blood flow to the capillary. That means more hydrostatic pressure favoring liquid to leave. It also causes mucus cells to release more mucus. What we're going to see is a lot of edema in the submucosa, a lot of mucus being produced, narrowed passageway for more than one reason, bronchial constriction and mucus accumulation. As I said, we can give the albuterol or we can give the ibuprofen. And I've already discussed the distant trapped air cells. Chronic bronchitis is still part of COPD. Chronic means you have an inflammatory response that is not acute like asthma. It lasts for three months or longer. And over the course of two years, you have reoccurring bouts of this. <clears throat> it is still, because, of its, because it's inflammation, we're going to have a lot of mucus production. <clears throat> and the mucus production is the issue. The mucus production is going to, one, narrow the passageway, two, because it's there all the time, we're going to have an increased distance that the gases have to travel through now for gas exchange. This is going to be an issue. These people with chronic bronchitis are called blue bloaters. Don't call them, no, no. They're called blue bloaters because nothing they do can change their gas exchange issue. They can't posture themselves any way that helps. So they will always look blue or cyanotic. They are not getting proper oxygen entering their bloodstream. Why are they called bloaters? Well, I'll remind you from Unit 3 that... <clears throat> There were local factors released by tissue beds that regulated how much blood arrived to the capillary bed. This was called reactive or active hyperemia. You tell me. If a tissue bed is working harder, <coughs> reactive was a response to obstruction. Active was from working harder. So active hyperemia was from a tissue bed working harder, releasing chemical signals that tell the upstream arterial to vasodilate and bring more blood. I'm working harder, I deserve more. If you remember from that slide from unit three, these chemical signals were a lack of oxygen because the cells used it, more CO2 because the cells were making it. I'll just stop there. In the respiratory system, in the pulmonary capillary bed, this is reversed. <clears throat> Increased CO2 does not tell the upstream arterial to vasodilate. Instead, it tells it to vasoconstrict. As if to say to the blood, don't bring blood over here in this capillary bed because this alveolus right next to us has a lot of trapped, dirty air. We can't get it out. Don't bring the blood here because more CO2 will enter the blood instead of leaving it. So more CO2 leads to more vasoconstriction in the pulmonary circuit. If there's more vasoconstriction in the pulmonary circuit, which side of the heart will have to work harder? <coughs> Did you already purge your memory cells from Unit 3? 
I mean, that's okay to do with a binder when you're like, unit three, take it out. Now I start over for unit four. You cannot go flush with unit three material. Which side of the heart pumps blood to the pulmonary circuit? Okay, good. How does blood flow? High pressure to low, which means the right ventricle has to generate more pressure than the blood pressure in the pulmonary circuit if you want a stroke volume to go into the pulmonary circuit. If the pulmonary circuit has too much vasoconstriction, that means the right side of the heart is experiencing more afterload. To remind you what that means from unit three, afterload is the blood pressure from the blood in that circuit from the previous beats. So if afterload is higher, this is called pulmonary hypertension for this side, then the right ventricle is gonna have to work harder. And it will hypertrophy, but not in a healthy way. It will hypertrophy so that the right ventricle will get weak and flabby. And we would expect our patient to start developing right-sided heart failure. And if it's a right-sided heart issue, where will we see the edema? Systemic. Enter the word bloater. Blue bloater. They will have systemic edema. Now, you might not notice the edema in their legs if they're wearing pants or in their feet if they're wearing shoes, but you'll see edema somewhere else, and the edema you will see will be in their fingertips. They will look like tree frog fingertips. And students say, why would you see the edema in the fingertips? And I say, because we walk like this with our hands down by our side. Gravity, right? We don't walk like this. We don't walk like that. <laughs> if we did, we wouldn't see the edema in the fingers. Please walk like that for the rest of class. Okay. <laughs> now when I made this slide, Mac was like four years old. That's how old this, this PowerPoint is. I should probably update it. <laughs> I mean, the content, physiology doesn't really change. It doesn't really change. But whenever I stop into Dr. Shaw's <clears throat> class and I look at her PowerPoints, because I gave her all of mine, I'm like, here, just use it. It'll save you time. Now when I walk into her class, I'm like, you bitch. <laughs> Why do you have to take everything I give you and make it a thousand times better? Her slides are amazing now. She's like, I'm to you want me to. Like, no. Because then it's yours. I'm using yours, not mine. She's amazing. <laughs> Female relationship. <laughs> I love you, Kat. Because her students watch this and they're going to reply right. Do you know what she says now? <laughs> She's amazing. And I mean that sincerely. <laughs> so Mac walks in when I made this slide, found this picture, and I'm clipping it in there and getting the cigarettes, and Mac's watching me. He's, Mom, is that a real life dead person? <laughs> but, yep, it's a real life dead person. That's all right. I just love how kids think. It's just, I love that. Little things that they say. Huh, yeah, you're right. Just makes me stop and think. And then it makes me think of other stuff, like, should I do it? Yeah. Why do they call them apartments when they're so close together? <laughs> <laughs> well, the Thursday class didn't hear it. Or why does a ship bring cargo, but a truck has shipment? <laughs> it's a little confusing. Feel free to think of more. This is the stuff that keeps me up at night. <laughs> so, this is a person with emphysema who died of emphysema. Can you see the barrel chest 
That's not, that's not a boob job. That's the chest <laughs> out. The barrel chest means that the chest wall wins. It's winning. And the lungs inside are overly compliant. Yeah, hey, we'll go with you, chest wall. But that means the recoil is not there. And that's the reason why the person with emphysema has a problem with exhale. But emphysema also destroys those shared walls with alveoli, making fewer, bigger alveoli. Hence, the exchange part is also a problem. And we call these people pink puffers. Pink because they can change their ventilation depth and the way they ventilate to keep gas exchange somewhat going, but they're going to have to work at it. And they work at it by becoming puffers. So they take a tripod position. They use their abdominal muscles to push their viscera up, doming the diaphragm up even higher to make the lungs recoil even more. And we call them puffers. Because that little amount, see, longer, shorter, longer, shorter, longer. That little bit longer, according to Poissuyer's law, the longer the air passageway, the more resistance. So when they purse their lips, they're making that air passageway just a little bit longer. They're damming up the air all the way into their lungs and that, remember that bronchial that I showed you that was collapsed? Backing up the air helps build up back resistance to open that collapsed part and then they slowly let the air leak out. That's a lot of work for exhaling. It's a lot of work. So they are called the pink puffers. And as I said before, overcoming the elasticity is another part of our work of breathing. And we need our lungs to have that middle of the road. If they are overly compliant, like you saw on the previous slide, then we can't exhale very well. If they're overly recoiled, which is what I'm about to cover next, then we can't inflate very well. And if you were paying attention on that slide for emphysema, it says technically emphysema could be thought of as both obstructive and restrictive. That's true, it could, but for testing purposes, that's, we don't think of emphysema as restrictive. Clinical setting, we don't think of it as restrictive. So any time on the test, if I say, which category does emphysema goes in, go, go in, what are you going to say? Obstructive. Obstructive. Well, then, Kara, why would you say it could technically go in restrictive? I'm going to tell you why it could, just a little bit, because it has everything to do with surfactant lack. Who typically gets emphysema? Is it only smokers that get emphysema? Nope. Monday, Wednesday class was quite surprised when I said, nope, it's not just people who are smokers. It's anyone who's also exposed to secondhand smoke. And it also can be you all. We live in Southern California. Our air quality is not the best. It is not. So you all could develop emphysema and you might not have ever had a cigarette in your life nor ever even lived with someone who smokes cigarettes. You could develop emphysema as well. And if it is pollutants, smoke, whatever you want to call it, it could kill the type 2 alveolar cells, and they are the ones that make surfactant. And that is what I'm going to tell you about. <clears throat> Just a moment. As I have already told you, the, the stretchability of the lungs is only a third accounted for by the elastic fibers. Two-thirds comes from this substance called surfactant. We know that water does not like to be pushed. It likes to ball up. It has this cohesive property. This cohesiveness from the pleural fluid around our lungs is quite helpful. But when it's inside our lungs, our mucous membranes, it's now part of the work. We must overcome this tendency for the water molecules to stick and make our alveoli look like they're tacos now. Because every breath in, we would have to peel the millions of alveoli open again. 
There's something else you should know about alveoli in this shared wall that I told you was so important. Not only do they share a wall, but they have a tunnel that connects one alveolus to the next, and I'll show you a picture of this. It's called an interalveolar pore. Not only do they share walls, but they help each other. They help, one will help an adjacent one inflate, for example, expand. This is called interdependency. And if you disrupt this interdependency, you have a harder time getting all the alveoli to open up. How does air flow? High pressure to low. So if an alveolus on one side has a higher pressure than the alveolus on the other side, and they share a pore between them, then the air will flow from the alveolus that has high pressure into the one that has low and help it to inflate. That's a really important concept. If alveoli lose their interdependency, then you're going to see, I'm going to prove to you after your break, smaller alveoli have a greater tendency to collapse. They need more help to be compliant, to open up. And when you come back from your break in 10 minutes, I will tell you about, and, and I will show you this interdependency picture, and I'll tell you about surfactant and how it helps alveoli inflate their neighbors. So go have a 10-minute break.